Hello, and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast. Today is Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. I want to learn what you want. I want to understand the needs that you have and how the National Hemophilia Foundation can help you in your particular situation. That voice belongs to NHF's new CEO, Len Valentino, and it is just one of the many voices that you'll hear today on this special NHF Washington Days episode. Thanks for listening. Washington Days in the Bleeding Disorders Community is an annual day of advocacy on Capitol Hill, or sometimes referred to as just The Hill, for those trying a little too hard. During the event, people affected by hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, rare protein deficiencies like factor X deficiency, or rare platelet disorders such as Glanzmann's thrombocenia, meet with their federal representatives, so Congress people and senators, to describe life with a bleeding disorder, ask for continued support of our community through ongoing programs at the CDC, NIH, and HRSA, as well as to make one specific ask, usually related to some new piece of legislation, sometimes asking for support and sometimes asking for opposition. Washington Days is generally held around this time of the year for reasons having to do with Congress's schedule, which means that us red tie-wearing bleeder people aren't the only constituents showing up for meetings, especially in an election year. You should see the wide array of people eating off of plastic trays in the cafeteria around lunchtime. It's entertaining. Last week, I attended Washington Days for the first time in five years, which I didn't realize until it was pointed out to me while I was there, and it struck me in a pretty unexpected way, I guess you could say. I'll share more on that at the end of the episode. But the last time that I was there, I remember talking to this one community mom from New York about how wonderful it would be if the experience of Washington Days could be brought to the greater community. So surprise, surprise, I brought the podcasting gear. I'm pleased to say that I spoke to a lot of community members while in Washington, a first-time attendee named Max, a 30-year attendee named Chris, a Nigerian-born visual artist blood brother living in D.C. who stopped by with some updates, and I talked to the community people there not just about Washington Days and the SNF or SNF Act, which I could do without the moniker, but I guess I will get into that more later, but we also caught up on community-wide topics, such as female bleeders and diagnoses, the sibling experience, the Latino and Hispanic community's unique needs, and a lot more. And as I mentioned up top, NHF's new CEO joined Bloodstream to introduce himself. So sit back and let's have ourselves... Oh, wait a minute. I should be careful not to steal that tagline from Amy Board of Ask the Expert. You know Ask the Expert, the podcast where you can hear patient and hematologist Dr. Jonathan Roberts talk about growing up with hemophilia and why he wanted to become a doctor. By the way, you can also, if you missed it, pop one episode back right here on Bloodstream for our Rare Disease Day special with Rare Revolution Magazine's CEO and Editor-in-Chief, or pop two back from my interview with gene therapy clinical trial participant Luke Pembroke. And if you subscribe to Bloodstream on wherever you personally do that behavior, then you'll never need to worry about missing an episode again. Shout out to our presenting sponsor, Takeda, without whom Bloodstream would not be possible. Thanks, Takeda. Bleedingdisorders.com is where you can go to learn more about Takeda and what they're up to. Oh, and actually, on that note, I do have one really important bit of business to get to before we jump in. From NHF's website dated Feb 28th, Takeda announced the recall of two lots of von Vendi von Willebrand factory recombinant, 1300 IU vials, on February 25th. HFA and NHF recognize that recalls can be very unsettling for many in the bleeding disorders community. We are in communications with Cicada to obtain additional detailed and timely information regarding the events that led up to the recall, as well as Takeda's plans for publicizing and accomplishing the recall. The statement goes on to reference the January 2020 safety summit that NHF and HFA held, which I'm going to get into a little later in the episode, and goes on to emphasize that this letter is the first step in continuing communications between HFA, NHF, and Takeda, and they insist they will keep us, the bleeding disorders community, informed as more information is gathered. So stay tuned to NHF and HFA's websites and social media accounts for updates, but in the meantime, if you treat with Von Vendi or have any concerns about it, please call your doctor or your healthcare professional immediately. And again, NHF and HFA will have more info as it's available. And since we are on the topic of safety, finally and quickly, in a proactive move, which I really appreciate, Genentech released a statement regarding coronavirus and the production of Hemlibra that included the following. Quote, 
To date, Hemlibra has been manufactured at Chugai's sites in Japan in line with common practice to ensure supply continuity of its medicines. Roche and Genentech are also producing Hemlibra at an alternative site outside of Japan. Our global manufacturing network has a robust plan for dealing with the impact of potential health and other global crises. As of now, we have not identified any critical component that would impact our ability to supply Hemlibra in the future based on current demand forecasts. Logistics and shipments of Hemlibra are also stable at this point in time. We are actively assessing and monitoring the situation. So there's that for you to be aware of as well. And that concludes today's safety demonstration. Thank you for joining Bloodstream Airlines. And now back to our regularly scheduled Washington Days program. Enjoy. Hello, Bloodstream listeners. Patrick here. It is Wednesday at about 3 o'clock Eastern. I am in Washington, and we are rapidly approaching the beginning of Washington Days training, followed by tonight's dinner. Uh, tomorrow's the big day on the Hill where all day long everybody's going to legislative appointments and coffees with representatives to discuss this year's priorities, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Thursday night, we reconvene back at the Regency Hotel to check in and summarize uh, the day, as well as for another advocacy-related uh, dinner. And then Friday morning, there's some trainings and a presentation on various joint efforts that NHF and HFA are working on, uh, not the least of which is the Safety Summit that just took place last month. So there'll be updates Friday morning from the Safety Summit. Definitely going to stick around to learn about that so I can tell you more about what took place at the Safety Summit. And Thursday, uh, Thursday evening back at the hotel, Len Valentino, the newly appointed CEO of the National Hemophilia Foundation, is going to be here and available uh, to answer questions. And I'm hopeful that I'll be able to grab him for a couple of minutes to introduce you all to the new CEO, Len Valentino. The uh, training is coming up, so I'm going to head there in just a moment. Basically, during these trainings, uh, I haven't been to one in a few years, but uh, the basic structure is that we go through what to do at Washington Days, how to tell your story, how to prepare for these meetings, um, some of the 101s, and then get into what this year's priorities are. This year, there's basically two big asks. The first is to continue supporting federal programs and funding that benefit the bleeding disorders community. So whether through the CDC, through HRSA, or the NIH, uh, which only in 2018 was responsible for uh, an inhibitor initiative that is in need of more support. So the first ask is to continue through NIH, HRSA, and CDC to supporting that which benefits the bleeding disorders community. And the second specific ask is if the members of Congress will co-sponsor the Hemophilia Skilled Nursing Facilities Access Act to improve access to skilled nursing facilities for Medicare beneficiaries with bleeding disorders. We're seeing problems around the community related to aging, post-surgery protocol, precise nature of the benefits. So this is uh, a big issue. I don't know that much right now about the Skilled Nursing Facilities Access Act itself. I'm going to learn more about that tonight. But that's the specific piece of policy that we are here to talk about. So that's the rundown for the next few days, and I am off to the training to get things started. All right, joining me now just ahead of the training is Max Feinstein from New Jersey. Max, hi, how are you? I'm all right. I'm a little uh, bleary-eyed, but we're uh, we're settling in. Did you have an early morning today? Yeah, um, I had an, like a late night thing that I was doing, so I had to come home and pack at like 2 a.m. And we were on a train by like 9:30. So, well, you look better than I guess you feel. So that's a compliment to you. All's well that's Maxwell. <laughs> so um, you were just mentioning to me this is your first time here at Washington Days. Yeah. What brought you out? Why did you come this year? This year, in some ways, it's sort of a prodigal son thing for me. My mother was very active in the community, and as you know, having hemophilia can really just be a very overwhelming thing. Some of us deal with it better than others. I, I felt overwhelmed. I felt frustrated as much as I'm grateful for everything at the time. It seemed like it just it took over my life, so I, I kind of distanced myself from it. And now that I've been talking about hemophilia within sort of my music community, within my art, and, and sort of seeing a place of wanting to deal with uh, issues of disinformation within the community, that sort of sparked me because I'm a bit of a spiteful person, and I saw somebody behaving in an untoward way 
And I'm like, come on, we don't need this in a bleeding disorders community, man. Life is hard enough. So, so all of that really sort of spurred me towards getting back into the community dialogue. And then what from Washington days are you hoping to learn or get out of this experience? I'm hoping to get more exposure to people in the legislative branch. I'm, I'm hoping to come out of this with a better appreciation for how the systems we have in place work. I want to have an understanding of how the people whose job it is to maintain and otherwise deal with these systems, how they do their job, how they look at their job, so that I can speak to them in the appropriate ways and, uh, you know, be an informed American with, uh, you know, the civics at hand. Because I, I feel like this is the stuff that we really don't talk about. This is the stuff that lets a lot of things seem scary, and these are the things that let a lot of things become scary, and uh, I want to do my part to do away with that. We only just got the folder, so not to put you on the spot, but do you know of any of the representatives that you're meeting with tomorrow? I did a little bit of research on one of the women. Uh, I saw a couple of papers that she wrote. They were cultural-based. I'm going to reread them tonight just to see if there's anything uh, in there. But I know she works with Albio Series, who I am familiar with. Well, very cool. It's cool that you're here, and we'll have to catch up with you along the way to see how it's going. I, I look forward. This is going to be a, a really good experience. I know it. Thanks, Max. After leaving Max, it was time for the training, which included some highly entertaining role play from HFA staff demonstrating the do's and don'ts for Thursday's meetings with lawmakers. I am deeply concerned about what's happening in my state. Why isn't your boss doing more? Ugh. Thank you for meeting with us today. As I previously shared, I have VWD, as do my kids. Access to care is critical to my family. I appreciate the support of Congress to protect our care. Ding! Thank you. Patient stories are so important and they really help us shape policy decisions. One more thing. Is your boss really as crazy as she seems? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Ding! When the training concluded, it was dinner time. I'm a big fan of dinner time personally, and I did eventually get to the scalped potatoes and couscous, but I was excited to see friends and colleagues, so I used a lot of the time to catch up with people. With my buddy Rigo from California. Rigo, what brought you to Washington Days this year? Uh, I just been like big, uh, I've been interested in politics and policy and everything, and growing up with hemophilia, you're, you're around like insurance issues and like laws that affect you so this is kind of like a good way for me to be more involved in like the policy uh you know the the whole procedure and everything that goes on in washington so we just finished up the training did you learn anything from it or take anything away from it that was particularly interesting to you uh, um what i did learn was the how do you the sniffs the sniffs Sniff, sniffs which not my favorite thing to say but I get it S N F sniff yeah that's that was something that I didn't know about before coming in specialized nursing facilities in general for sure yeah for sure because I didn't I wasn't in any of that kind of situations yeah, I don't have Medicare but um, but that's really important to know and I think it's something that if if it wasn't hemophilia it could be something else like any other kind of specialized treatment could be targeted too. How, have you looked up anybody that you're going to be meeting with tomorrow, or do you have any particular excitement about a, a meeting that you have lined up? Um, well, I had Adam Schiff, but I think I had to cancel it because of another meeting. But uh, that was. But the other one was uh, I actually brought my representative's little mailer, so I'm going to see if she, I'm actually meeting her tomorrow. Oh, there it is. Okay, Lucille Roy Ball. Bard, I guess. So, yeah, okay. So I'm going to see if she can sign it. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to see if she can sign it, but we'll see. If I meet her, if, I, if she's around, I'll, I'll take the chance. But if not, whatever. Fair enough, man. All right, well, thanks, Rigo. And we've got another buddy here named Ivan. We've heard from Ivan before. You may have heard him on the Journeys podcast. You're going to hear a lot more from him in the not-too-distant future. Ivan, what brought you to Washington Days this year? Well, definitely, uh, I think it's important for us to um, voice you know, our voices, um, to voice our opinions, you know, and get out there and really speak up for our community. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the government and uh, making it difficult for us to get our, our medication and 
you know, because it's so expensive. And we really need that in order for us to live and survive. And I have a daughter who has hemophilia, her children, her boys, possibility that they can have hemophilia. So I just want to make sure that, you know, um, we do what's what's right to help, you know, set the bar or the future for our, the next generation of children, you know. And so many girls with hemophilia struggle to get that diagnosis, too, which then makes it harder for them to get seen by an HTC. Gets, they can't get factor. So that diagnosis itself is just so critical, isn't it? That's correct. I've had uh, some issues with my daughter. Um, she's had a, a, a right knee a bleed several times already, and uh, we're trying to get her to get factor, and we just can't get her to, to get any uh, prescription. And that only because she's a woman, and they tell her that she can go, she can go with um, birth control, tranexamic acid, or even stymate, but no factor. So I know we got to let you go to dinner here in a second, but I also want to ask you, you do a lot of work in the Latino and Hispanic community here in the U.S. What are some of the concerns that you've noticed within the Latino and Hispanic community that maybe the white community and other people might not be aware of? Well, one of the main ones is also voicing their, their um, being able to communicate with their HTCs and their doctors, their concerns. Uh, a lot of them don't have... Uh, um, you know, uh, the right words to say, uh, um, some of them that don't live in California, even some in California um, have issues, you know, with language barriers, uh, mental health. You can you can we can also talk about that. Um, there's a, there's a few out there that I can tell you, um, you know, they struggle with. You know, and because there's not a lot of uh, programs out there for the Hispanic community around the country, um, it's hard for them to also voice their opinion and what they, what they think about, you know, these certain situations. But um, I know that we're going to have something going on, and I'm very excited about that too. Yeah, you'll be digging into that very soon. All right, thank you guys. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you. So I'm here now with uh, Sue Lurt and Rachel. Rachel, um, we were just talking about the value of conferences and how they can really make a difference with uh, issues that need special attention. And Rachel has a personal story on, on that very issue. Would you mind sharing that? Sure. Um, so in November, I went to the Women's Hemophilia Retreat in Michigan, and they were talking about the importance of keeping like a pain journal and recording or documenting all of your bleeds or what you think are bleeds. And so I did that, and two weeks ago, I had a meeting with my HTC, and for the first time, they put me on Profi. So it was exciting to finally be validated and um, I was diagnosed six years ago so it's been a long time coming. What do you think helped cross the finish line? It's taken six years. What happened in just the last, I don't know, three months, six months, 12 months that has you on Profi today? One, um, we got a new doctor to the HTC and I feel like documenting was a big key because I would tell them when I had a bleed or you know text them or email them but I didn't keep it all in one spot and when we would go to the appointments I was focused more on my boys versus myself so I think just having it all in a book where they could just flip through and she was like uh you bleed a lot I'm like yeah I know so I know we have a lot of women in the community who listen to this podcast, and I imagine many of them are in a similar position where when they're dealing with bleeding disorders, it's often for their children. And when they're going to the clinic, it's often for their children. In addition to keeping a pain journal, is there another tip or two that you could give caregivers to make sure that they're keeping track of their own health care needs? Um, I'm not very good on that because... Uh I, like other women, put my boys first, but this appointment, I went solely for myself. I didn't go with the boys, where in the past, it was the boys' appointment, and they saw me, you know, so it was a very long day, and the focus was primarily on the boys, and so they would, you know, I got a script and stuff like that, but I think just really documenting and then just setting time aside just for myself versus with them. Which, as you said, sometimes is not a first instinct. You're a great mother. You care about your boys. You have to kind of make yourself practice a little bit of self-care and self-love. One more question for you. Um, gene therapy is something I've been thinking about a lot. I just talked to a friend of mine for this podcast who's on a clinical trial, and we talked a bit about the emotional experience of this paradigm shift in his treatment life. Obviously, going on prophylaxis is not the same as entering a clinical trial for gene therapy, but it is a big change in your treatment and management of a bleeding disorder. Did you find emotionally, existentially, just your identity as someone in this world, was that shifted at all when you were heard and got this prophylaxis uh, uh, prescription finally? Well, it was just a big relief because just for years, 
being told nothing was wrong and, you know, thinking it was all in your head and then finally getting a diagnosis six years ago. So that was a huge relief, but yet I had a diagnosis, but still wasn't getting full proper treatment. So for her to validate me and say, no, you need to be on Profi. You need to treat your bleeds. It was honestly a relief. It wasn't like, oh, something's different. It was just Finally, I have answers. They believe me. Congratulations. That's huge. And Sue Lurch from Michigan, for you, having hosted the conference that um, Rachel credits as helping with this journey, how does it feel to know that you have put something together that is showing results like this? It just gives me the chills, really. When she told me and came over to the table just now and said that, I was just like, oh my gosh, this makes it all so worth it. One person to have that kind of result just from really learning how to self-advocate and realizing you're important and your boys are obviously important, but you and your care are really necessary to have success for everybody. And I think, you know, we had 150 women that came from 32 states around the country to the conference, and we're just really, really grateful we've had the opportunity to pull this together and to work with so many amazing physicians and individuals who are affected. So it's specifically for women who have hemophilia A or B or are diagnosed carriers. And there are so many women that have not felt heard. And I think that utilizing the skills that you know, or not even skills. It's not really skills. It's not about that. It's about documenting the information, going in and being a a super strong advocate, which is really tough for a lot of us. And I think that being with all these other women who are in a similar situation and hearing their stories is really just motivating and inspiring and exciting and and it's exactly what we want to have happen so it's actually coming up again it's going to be october 9th through 11th 2020 um again at the uh marriott or not the marriott oh gosh they're gonna be mad the weston at the detroit metro airport so it's super easy and rachel was saying yeah it worked out great she didn't even need a coat coming from texas because it's all right there and people fly in we have amazing presenters and i think just the women getting to spend time with other women who are in the same or similar situation that makes all the difference doesn't it Rachel absolutely just knowing that you're not alone and you aren't the only one it's just so nice to have that community and the women truly understand what you're going through well thank you both so much for sharing I think that means a lot thank you thank you thank you all right, I'm here with my buddy Chris. Chris, what year is this for you at Washington Days? How long have you been coming? Oh, probably like the 30th year or so. Wow, so you've been coming to like pretty much all of these. Yeah, yeah, I've been here every year. What have you seen as some of the significant evolutions of it, say, in just the last five years? I think in the last five years, they've been able to get record-breaking numbers of uh, participants to come down to Washington Days. I also hope that they've been able to instill um, the message that You can also get into your local offices of your federal representatives back home in the district uh, more than once a year and usually have more time with them and really, you know, hit home the issues that are of most importance in access to care, protection for the the patient protection uh, clauses in the ACA and, and just maintaining insurance and coverage. What have you found tactically over the course of these years has been most helpful? You just mentioned be visiting representatives at the home office. Um, are there certain things that you've done that you have found to be particularly helpful when trying to advocate? I think what I've found particularly helpful is be consistent, is uh, keep going into the offices, keep contacting them, keep sending them letters, letting them know, hey, I'm still here. If you need anything, you hear anything about hemophilia or is going to relate to my health care, you know, give me a call. I'll come in. I'll bring whoever we need to bring in to get you the proper answers to the questions to make sure that, you know, when you're voting on these important pieces of legislation, that the legislation is truly going to benefit all whom it's intended to to benefit. There's the, uh, as Joanna Gray and I'm blanking on the other individual's name, but as they presented, there's the soft ask and the hard ask tomorrow. Outside of those, though, what are issues that are top of mind for you as you come here? Maybe not necessarily things that are going to drive the meetings that you're in, but as an advocate, things that you feel as though need this kind of attention. I think the community uh, really needs to understand the details and both the pros and the cons of the particular issue to make sure that everyone 
is protected by these legislative uh, work, pieces of work because um, you know when certain insurances do certain things they may help one community but another disorder community may, may not be may not be helped as much and may actually be hurt in the process when things are paid for maybe under major medical versus prescription drug or prescription drug versus major medical um, the hemophilia community is very fortunate they have um, copay assistance cards and a robust program of, of systems and networks that sort of take care of some of these issues where some of these other conditions they don't have that as well and it really is scary some things get paid for under prescription versus major medical or or versus the other or in, in Medicare get paid for under Part B instead of Part D so people really need to understand the integral workings of, of insurance and how and how really how a bill becomes a law from the beginning to the end uh, last question for you. Over the time that you've been coming here, have you developed any particular relationships that have been valuable to have as an advocate? We talk a lot about relationships and how valuable they are in this context. Have you developed any with your representatives that you found to be helpful? Oh, absolutely. Um, I get into the local office, I would say, at least six times a year, meet with their chief of staff, both here in D.C. and back in the district. And that way um, they know who I am, I know who they are, and I try to keep them a aware of the situation and aware of different different um, intricate aspects of some of the legislation especially um, what's more important too is uh, having a relationship with your state representatives back in the state or commonwealth in which you live in because um, some of the insurance laws are covered under state law so where you would think you would want to come and complain to the feds about say Medigap issues with uh, being under 65 maybe being on disability you can't get Medigap in a certain state um, but those are state laws, and and things can be worked on on both a federal and a state level. The point you made, th some things can only be worked on on a federal or state level. Right, right, yeah. Some things are specific, specifically uh, federal, um, r repairable or fixable or solvable, and some things are only state repairable, solvable, or fixable. And, and um, unless there's a robust system in both on a state and federal level, um, it could be a very bad day for a person living with a bleeding disorder. Insightful stuff. Thanks for a couple minutes, man. Good luck tomorrow. Yes, yes thank you. Okay, 9 o'clock Wednesday night. We're getting toward the end of Wednesday here, and I am sitting with my friend Felix, an artist in D.C. and a fellow bro blood brother. You can tell it's late at night. I can barely speak. How are you, Felix? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very well. I was very intrigued by what you were just telling me, the the, the project that you are working on. Uh, it sounds extremely interesting and important, and I was wondering if you would share a little bit of it with our listeners. Well, the project, my next project is with the Nigeria Hemophilia Foundation. And uh, it's just basically going there to showcase my experience that I have um, living with hemophilia. And um, so just going there, um, talking to them about my experience and also doing uh, several workshops with them with doing portraiture. As an art teacher, um, I just love uh, empowerment of uh, students that I work with, but with this chance, being a hemophilia, I'm able to give back uh, to the country that I was I was born um, and I was raised in. Um, but I was also raised in Washington D.C. too. So just seeing both of how I grew up and just talking about my experience, and then hopefully bringing back all the materials back to the U.S. and curating the show. So I feel like you're maybe a little bit too humble, and I might have to pull Mona, your wife, in for a moment. Um, because when you talk about going to Nigeria and just sharing your experience, um, you're, you're short selling the quality of artist who will be going to Nigeria and what that artist intends to do with the people he's in Nigeria with. So maybe Mona can fill us in a little bit of what kind of artist you are and uh, what exactly it is you're, you're looking to do. Yes, um, my husband is um, a great artist who has graduated from the Corcoran College of Art, Micah. Um, which is graduated for his MFA program um, and has sold works t to um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's had um, o been featured in O Magazine um, and bought by a huge collector by the name of Peggy Cooper Kayfritz. So, yes, he is short selling himself. Um, he is a great artist and he loves to bring his work. Um, to speak to the people. Um, that is who he is and always will be. Um, to use his vehicle of art as a way of social justice. 
Can you say a little more about the role of social justice in your work? Well, um, that role is important because, um, I mean, just being um, a Nigerian American, um, I just felt some type of, you know, racism and injustice uh, towards uh, me and even um, just um, the, the culture um, barrier, just understanding um, the, the civil rights movement compared to the Nigerian civil rights movement when I came from. So, um, and also just being a teacher, I'm able to see um, just kids at, at a disadvantage in different parts of the neighborhood, and I'm seeing how that is affecting education. So, um, just being a teacher for this long, I've seen so many kids at disadvantage, and that just kind of makes me want to you know, paint um, everyday people um, so other viewers can see and raise consciousness about why is this going on so something can be done about it. 25-year teacher, too, he was just telling me how he can't really go anywhere, him and Mona in this city, without recognizing former students, meeting people on buses, stopping fights. He's just like, you're like a mayor. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a mayor. Actually, um, that's, um, that's, that's a very humbling experience because uh I mean, I had dreams, but I never thought it was going to, you know, come this soon. Actually, my wife had to remind me how long I've been teaching because I had to take a break and say, like, it's been this long years filling out an application. So um, then I started saying that I've been teaching over <laughs> 20 years. But um, it's just been a humbling experience. But, I, you know, I feel like my work is not done. I feel like God put me on this earth to do more work and I'm yet to see it come through. Where can people see some of your stuff online? Where can they go? They can go to my website www.osuchiku.com that's You're definitely going to have to spell that. That's O S U C H U K W U dot com. That was very clear. We'll put a link in the program notes too to make it easy. Thanks for taking some time to chat with me. It looks like uh, you may have uh, some little ones to tend to sooner than not. They're being very patient. But they can also um, check out my Instagram page at uh, Chinedu Felix Osuchiku. That's C H I N E D U F E L I X O S U C H U K W U. Program notes. Felix, Mona, thank you both. <laughs> Okay, so it's Thursday, Hill Day now. I am here with fellow Californian Mia. Hello, Mia. Hi. <laughs> and we are in the Senate Heart Office building. Mia, can you tell us about what we uh, just experienced? Um, yeah, we just met with Kathy Irwin, one of um, Kamala Harris's staff members, and we got to tell her about some of the issues why we're here today, um, some of the federally funded um, programs that we need support for, and the SNF Act about supporting um, the separation of hemophiliacs um, bail differently than regular patients and she was very supportive of all the bills and she was very eager to learn about hemophilia and inhibitors and all sorts of things like that. And you were actually uh, the person to present to her the two things that we were specifically here asking about. What helped you uh, appreciate, especially this SNF Act, it's kind of specific. How did you wrap your head about it so that you were able to speak so specifically with the limited amount of time you have with a staffer? I think um, especially like just my parents and stuff, this is going to affect them, this is going to affect me, it's going to eventually my kids like eventually will all grow into this and we'll all have to deal with it so it's just it's a very important issue that hopefully we can take care of now so that we're not struggling with it later and taking care of it for the older generation as well. And with the rest of the meetings today and your time in DC in general, is there anything that you specifically are hoping to get from this experience? Um, my new meeting is actually coming up soon with my representative, so I'm super excited um, to talk to him, hopefully like get involved in my college with hemophilia, stuff like that. Um, talk to him about the issues and just really advocate and tell him why we're here, let them know who we are and what we have going on. Yeah. Thanks, Mia. No problem. Thank you. All right, I'm with my buddy Scott now. Scott, what year is this for you coming to Washington Days, or how many times have you been here? I think I've been like eight or nine times overall. Yeah. And have you noticed anything significant change in either how we approach things or how we are received over the course of time? Yeah, it's been interesting. I think that, you know, the, 
as we've come over the years that people are familiar you know with our group walking in uh, but now all walking with the red ties I think has really stood out to you know some of the the offices that we've met they they know who we are when we walk in which has been nice they sort of know the background story and you know they're always interested to hear what the present issues are you know one of the meetings that I was in this morning the person that we met with was rather stone-faced you know they didn't really want to let you know whether or not there was support for the bill I'm curious yeah. in your nine years of experience yeah. have you had uh, particularly challenging meetings to navigate we've had a, a couple um, you know, there's always you know the the staff member that's unfamiliar with you know the issues at hand and may not understand the significance to our community which can be you know challenging to kind of help help them see the, the light of day I guess yeah. you could say but um, yeah you know it's there are those but um, that's our job to help them overcome those obstacles and understand you know why it's important and how they can help and what do you find yourself doing outside of this particular day to help advocate for the community both on a federal and a state level what do you what do you participate in you know, I always uh, do my best to, you know, attend as many legislative days as I can, you know, for the different foundations. and On the state level? On the state level, yes, uh, correct, as well as Washington days. And also just on an ongoing basis, help to educate, you know, our community and, and mem members beyond, um, you know, on the different things that are impacting our community and how they can help, you know. I always try to be a strong advocate of people, you know, getting to know who their local representatives are and calling, emailing, faxing, you know, when issues are that we're presented with, um, we need their help on. Yeah. I know we have to move for in just a second, but uh, one more question for you. Your dear friend and colleague mentioned in our last meeting how when you guys were growing up, as people who are today in their 40s, you weren't expecting to live until today. And that's part of what we're trying to talk about is that there's aging-related challenges with hemophilia that we just haven't had to face before. What is it like for you to kind of like hear that and process that and think about that while you're here oh that's completely unreal um, first of all I'm really grateful to have to have those conversations and be in this position because absolutely I was told at the age of eight that I would have and upon being um, finding out that I was uh, HIV positive that I would have six months you know or as little as six months or as much as six years to live so eight years old that would have put me at you know 14 15 and here I am at 42 married with four kids and life is going really well so yeah I'm, I'm excited to have that conversation um it's uh it's not scary at this point it's um something i look forward to and very um proud to be here to support that uh that argument i guess good luck this afternoon thank you all right i'm back with my buddy max his first time here in dc we're on the other side of all the meetings now max how'd it go it went uh, very well. I'm lucky that New Jersey has a rich history of bleeding disorder advocacy, and as a result, a lot of the people we met with had at least a passing familiarity with it. And uh, our meetings actually seemed to run ahead of schedule, which I was not expecting. Was there anything that came up in the meetings that was surprising to you? No, actually, this all went approximately the way that the information was brought to us last night, and nobody seemed to have an issue with it. When ultimately we lay this stuff out in factual ways, it, it seems like there's no surprise. What was the experience like of going to the Rayburn building and the Senate building and walking past the Capitol and all those kind of pieces of the experience? I learned I'm fonder of marble than I initially thought. It's some beautiful architecture, uh, but it was it was just nice to be out, and it did feel like there was a sense of importance to what we did, which there is. Could you see yourself coming back again next year? Yeah. What about getting involved with, like, uh, Jersey State Hill days? Uh, I could definitely see myself continuing to advocate in this way. Are you uh, going to see anything else in D.C. while you're here? No. Tomorrow night, uh, I have to go immediately to play four hours of music, which I know sounds like such a big deal, such a rough deal. No. I, I, we're getting on a train in the morning, uh, afternoon rather. Tell people where they can find your music. You can find just about anything musically I'm doing at uh, maxfeinstein.com. That's Einstein with an F. So uh, you can find my own work through that and the sort of registry of the musicians I work with. Thanks, Max. Thank you. After parting from Max, I got to sit down with NHF federal policy advisor Joanna Gray, who, along with her colleague Ellen Riker, really make Washington Days happen. Okay, joining me now is Joanna Gray, who, along with Ellen Riker, is extraordinarily responsible for what Washington Days actually is. So first off, thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm happy to be here. And more importantly, I'm happy that you're here with us in Washington. It's a pleasure. And today was uh, extremely productive. 
I'm curious, for many of us, this is a two or three day event for the chapter executive directors. There's a lot more planning, of course, that goes into this. But for you and for Ellen to make 250 meetings happen across 45 to 50 states, how long are you working on Washington days? Um, yeah, it is not a two-day effort for us. Um, and you said at the beginning, Ellen and I are extraordinarily responsible for this. And I joked with someone earlier, if they have a good time, sure, I'm happy to say that I'm responsible. But if anything went wrong, it was a team effort. Um, but the truth is, there's a lot of folks who work for many, many weeks to get Washington Days together. There are several members of NHF's internal policy team who work with us on all the plans. And this year, it was really exciting as we were working on the SNF bill and um, doing everything to try and get the bill introduced before Washington Days. But we start planning in earnest um, in December is when we start talking about what our issues will be. Um, and it's, you know, we have weekly meetings to, to, to talk about plans and who will speakers be and, you know, writing fact sheets and things like that. So it's many weeks of, of um of effort, but it's one of my favorite things that I do all year, and it's um, it's a lot of work, and but it's rejuvenating to me to see so many advocates come who are so nervous on Wednesday night because they've never done before, and now as I see them now on Thursday night, they're so excited about what they've accomplished, and I know people bring those skills home, and so it has a ripple effect, and lots of folks will come back next year, which is, I think, a sign that they had a good experience, too. How long have you been doing this? I'm curious to know, treatment has changed, insurance has changed. Over the last 10 years, so much has changed. I'm curious how much that has um, played into the way that you think about the meetings, not just the topics that we're focused on, but even just thinking about approaching the meetings. Yeah, so I have worked with NHF since 2007. So this is my 12th my 12th Washington days, I think. Um, And I think you're right. What we've seen over the last 10 years, really since the ACA debate, um, is how much passion folks have about healthcare policy. And I think that's changed both the issues that we've talked about on the Hill. It certainly changed the size of our event. Um, We, you know, when I first started working with NHF, it was maybe 250 to 300 people, which for a patient advocacy group Hill Day is pretty huge. Um, you know, but now we have more than 400, more than 500 some years. And um, sometimes that's because people are really scared about something that may be happening at Washington. During the ACA repeal and replace debate um, in 2017, there was a lot of folks who came because I think they were really worried. But I'm really encouraged that folks have kept coming back and um, There's always an important issue to talk about for the community. I think we have lots of fights still to fight. We've had a lot of advocacy success working together, clearly many more challenges. And so I I can't imagine when we won't need something like Washington Days and when we won't need the power of our grassroots advocates. Does an election year change anything about the way that you conceive of Washington Days? Um, Yes and no. I think... um, in an election year, we, we often get more member meetings. I think members of Congress prioritize constituent meetings in an election year. I think we, we often have good meetings, um, and members of Congress and their staff want to be supportive of what we're asking them to do. It's maybe a little bit easier in an election year. Um, what's also interesting, I think, is the first year of a Congress. We always do Washington Days in February or March. Um, and in a new Congress, like last year, there were 100 new members of Congress. Many of them didn't have offices. They didn't have staff. You know, they weren't staffed up yet. They didn't know what their committee assignments were. So the the first year of a Congress can sometimes be a little bit logistically challenging, particularly when there's many, many new members. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the election this year and then what Congress looks like next year. That's fun. I didn't know to think about that. So that's something to anticipate going into next year. All right. My last question for you is what is one thing that you are going to do on the other side of this weekend? What's one stress reliever, take the shoes off, thing that you can do to take a nice deep sigh of relief? Good question. Um, One, I'm hoping to sleep for a long time this weekend. There have been many late nights over the last few weeks. Um, And to, yeah, and I'm going to, to say a ridiculous mid-30s female thing to say, I'm going to go to restorative yoga (laughs) on Saturday. And that's my number one source of stress relief and how I will celebrate another successful Washington Days. 
Well, uh, as someone who has gone to more than one sound bath, I can totally appreciate <laughs> that. Thanks for all you do, and thanks for the few minutes. Oh, sure. My pleasure. And before Thursday came to a close, I did get some time with NHF's new CEO, Dr. Len Valentino. I am very pleased to be joined now by NHF's new CEO, Dr. Len Valentino. Hello, doctor. Thanks, Patrick. Hello, how are you? I'm good. I'm realizing now, what should, I don't know what to call you now in this role. You're, what, what, what's the, what, what, Dr. Valentino, Len, CEO, Len Valentino, what's, what's the best title now? So uh, nobody's called me Dr. Valentino for years. Even my patients when I was practicing called me Dr. V. So Len is perfectly fine. Fair enough. You know, Dr. Donna DiMichele was my pediatric hematologist until I was like 25 or 6. And to this day, she's like, call me Donna. I'm like, hey, Dr. DiMichele, she said, call me Donna. And I just can't do it. Um, so this is, I think, the beginning of week two or three for you. So just in a word or two, how's the first uh, week or two here been? Exciting. Very exciting. I mean, it's, it's an amazing uh, organization to be uh, affiliated with. And it's an amazing community to be representing. So you have a rich history in the community. You were at Rush for quite a long time and then Baxter and Spark. So you got to see the industry and the therapeutic manufacturing side in two very different worlds at Baxter and Spark with gene therapy. What compelled you to apply for this role when the position was opened? Well, I think it's a... um it's a really exciting time for hemophilia and bleeding disorders in general with all of the new therapies that are coming. And I think that um, one of the major gaps that we have is really helping patients to understand all the therapeutic options that are available to them and then really being able to make choices that are solid, sound choices that are based in knowledge and information. And I think that's where... NHF and other advocacy organizations can really do a a real service for patients is helping them understand what their opportunities and options are. And, you know, it's, it's about risk versus benefits. And a lot of times we only hear about the benefits. And I think it's really important that we understand sort of the entire spectrum of what's available to us and what that might mean for our futures. Is there, so to support that, is there anything about NHF in, in terms of how it's executing its mission, how it interacts with the chapters and community around the country that might shift or be different or look a little different to, again, support what you're speaking about? Yeah, so, you know, NHF traditionally has had a focus on advocacy and education and then some research. One of the things that I think is going to be critically important moving forward is strengthening the relationship with chapters, for example, because chapters have a particular population that they reach that a national organization might not reach. So I think having that strong relationship is going to be important, especially as we try to develop, uh, you know, more Uh, focused research opportunities for the bleeding disorders community. One of my main goals is to create a national research agenda for the bleeding disorders community. And what does that look like? What, who would be involved in putting that together? And what's sort of the, the, uh, the, the end goal of uh, an agenda like that? Well, the end goal is simple. The end goal is improving the care for patients with bleeding disorders. I think the people who will participate in this are you. It's everybody who's listening to this podcast are going to be participants in that. We need input from every stakeholder that's available. We need, you know, across the entire spectrum of stakeholders. This is federal partners. This is HTCs. It's patients. It's chapters. It's all of the organizations that have a stake in the bleeding disorders community need to have input into this. So it sounds like something at some point there'll be a a communications brief about submitting input for this agenda? Absolutely. We'd like to have potentially have some sort of a face-to-face meeting where we could bring stakeholders together. I think some some of it will be done electronically. You know, it's it's, we're in an electronic world. Some of it can be done face-to-face and other, I think we can gather input from networks of people. So Uh, something like this podcast is incredibly powerful to spread word and then bring uh, information back into the community. I know there's a lot NHF's done for women with bleeding disorders in the last number of years, more for people with inhibitors and supporting research for people with inhibitors through work here at the CDC. Um, 
what are when we think about our different sub communities and some of those needs as new treatments are becoming available and there's many options and a lot of excitement there's still a lot of need how are you thinking about those two things in balance so it, it's there's a there's a lot of need so the palette is very broad as to what needs to be done I don't think we're in at a time where we're going to be, quote, curing hemophilia right now. So hemophilia is going to be here. We're going to need to have sustainable care models, treatment centers. We need to have doctors who are capable of taking care of the patients. Um, We need patients who are educated and participating in their care. So what I see is um, opportunities, for example, for rare and ultra rare diseases. Women with bleeding disorders, we're learning more and more about and supporting those patients as well. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities to move beyond just the sort traditional hemophilia patient um, and really the severe hemophilia patient. Because if gene therapy comes to fruition, we're going to have a community with many more mild hemophilia patients. And understanding how to manage those patients is going to be another important thing. Another area that I think is going to be critically important is mental health. There, you know, we, we know that there's a mental health epidemic, um, not only in hemophilia, but in the country in general, in, in the world. So we need to be able to deal with mental health issues for our bleeding disorders patients. Another area I think is age-related comorbidities, huge issue. People with hemophilia are living longer. People with other bleeding disorders are getting better care. They're living longer. We need to be able to deal with uh, atrial fibrillation in a 75-year-old uh, who's you know, on a, a prophylactic regimen. So there's, there's a lot of questions that we still need to deal with. And that's where the research focus can go to. That's one of the points we were talking about today with the specialized nursing facilities and how with an increase with more and more hemophiliacs aging and reaching older ages that we've just not seen before, we're having to deal with things we haven't before. We have to get ahead of things that are going to hit us harder, such as not knowing what to do with patients when they leave the hospital. Um, We have to deal with that now before it becomes a bigger problem later. What's one thing about you, Len, that people may be uh, surprised to know or something that keeps you uh, interested and occupied outside of this bleeding disorders world? So my uh, hobbies, I like to cook. So I uh, will cook pretty much anything. Uh, Give me a challenge. So one of the things that uh, uh, my wife and I like to do is to go to a restaurant and then I'll look at uh, the meal and then I'll try to recreate it at home. It's always a fun thing to try to do. Um, I'm dabbling in gardening. Uh, growing some of my own uh, uh, vegetables and and herbs so I have a more sustainable uh, kitchen. And then another thing I enjoy is uh, sports. So it's uh, watching baseball games, going to baseball games. Uh, So those are the things I like to do outside of uh, my professional life. Who are your sports teams? Uh, Unfortunately, in Chicago, it's the Chicago White Sox, not the Cubs. Uh, but I'm an equal opportunity uh, rooter, so I, uh, I enjoy sports in general. Last question for you. One of the things that really, and I, I mean this sincerely, I'm not just saying this to you. One of the things that really impressed me when we first sat down together years ago was a conversation about gene therapy and what it could mean. You very quickly took it to a global perspective and how gene therapy, as much as it could do for our population here in the United States and in Europe, what it could do for people with hemophilia in developing countries and how if we could just kind of bridge the gap between now and then, we have so much coming thereafter. That really impressed me. And it, again, it, you, you unprompted kind of took that global perspective. It's the National Hemophilia Foundation, not the International Hemophilia Foundation. But nevertheless, I'm curious how that thinking plays into your work now as CEO of, N- of NHF. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, You know, we are very fortunate in the United States to have multiple products. You know, there's only almost 30 products to treat hemophilia patients. The rest of the world isn't nearly as fortunate as we are. And I think as good global citizens, we need to think about how we can help other areas of the world that aren't as fortunate as we are. So I see the National Hemophilia Foundation playing a very important role in leadership in areas uh, where... Uh, the the hemophilia care is not nearly as well developed so I think it's it's one about leadership two it's about bringing our expertise to other areas 
through, for example, the WFH partner uh, opportunities. That was one of the things that I did when I was at the treatment center. We had a WFH twinning program. That partnering opportunity really gave me a new sense of uh, belonging to that global community. I know tonight you're going to get to meet a lot of members of the community here. They're going to meet you for the first time. Um, What are you hoping to learn from the people that you're going to meet in just an hour or two? I want to learn what you want. I want to understand the needs that you have and how the National Hemophilia Foundation can help you in your particular situation, whether that's advocacy um, for skilled nursing facilities or another issue, whether it's educational needs that you need. Um, What are the research questions? What are the patient important issues that we should be focusing our research efforts on? I can create a research project that's important to me. That's irrelevant. It should really be research that's focused on patient important questions. So it's going to be driven. I think the research agenda should really be driven by patients. What's important to you? Well, Len, Dr. V, the new CEO of NHF, thank you for taking a few minutes during this very busy time to say hello to the listeners of Bloodstream. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, Friday morning, Washington Days is coming to a close, and joining me now is my friend Jen from Massachusetts. Hello, Jen. Hello. I say Massachusetts because you're a part of NEHA, but are you actually in Massachusetts? Yes, we live in Dudley, Mass. Okay, I guess I could have just gone with it, but I wasn't sure, so I figured I would check rather than lie on the podcast. Um, But you and I were just talking about some of what uh, you're focused on within the community. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. So I'm focused on the siblings in the community. Um, Started a few years ago with my daughter going to a conference and she got really angry because she was in a room with doctors and nurses and came out to me and said, they're talking to me like I have hemophilia, but I don't. And so from then I started working with them, especially more so at New England Hemophilia's family camp. And when you started working with them, what did you see as the need that you were filling? What was some of the initial feedback um, that was guiding what you decided to do with the siblings? There's anger with the siblings when we go to conferences because it's all about their sibling with a bleeding disorder, and so they feel like they're forgotten. And one of the key reasons that started me was because they could be future parents of children with bleeding disorders, and if we're not supporting them now, how are they going to rely on us in the future? Yeah, you actually corrected me quite appropriately when I said that, you know, uh, here at Washington Days, it might not have much to do with why we're here. And you said, no, it does have to do with why we're here. It's the future of our community. And that's absolutely right. It shows my own bias that sometimes I forget how right. siblings and carriers are potentially future parents. So we all have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, what are you doing this year in 2020 with the siblings? When did it start and what are you doing this year with the group? It started about four years ago at Niha's camp. Um, I worked closely with another mom, but when I took it over after she passed away, um, we did a what's your rose of a sibling with hemophilia and what's your thorn. And a lot of it is that they get passed around to family if their sibling is in the hospital or needs to get treated and they get angry about that. Parents sometimes miss out on their things. I missed out on my daughter's first father-daughter dance because my son Daniel was in the hospital for a week. So now at camp, it's a open session about what they can discuss. Um, And now they actually want to have their own t-shirts at camp that say sibling role model in the back. What do you hope might catch on at the other chapters across the country or from a national perspective? I guess if there was one thing that you could share with other community leaders around the country about how to make the sibling experience more tethered into the conferences and the education days and the camps, what would you say? Um, They get angry, they get sad when they see their siblings going through a bleeding disorder, um, an injury or whatever. They're future parents. They could be potential future parents. Has your daughter expressed any anger toward you or the family because of all this? More so my son. Why, why are you getting mom and dad's attention more? When, when he was younger and had a lot of bleeds, why are you getting mom and dad's attention more and I'm, and I'm not? And have you found that to be generally similar? Yes, very similar. 
Well, thank you for recognizing a, a need that needed to be addressed and for taking on a leadership role to make sure that it gets done. Change doesn't happen unless people like you see and act. So thank you. Thank you very much. I am very excitedly with suitcase in hand, ready to leave Washington days. And I bump into Stephanie Lapido from uh, the Hemophilia Association of New Jersey. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. And then I learned that she I was very disappointed because I was missing the announcement about the NHF HFA collaboration which is very important. And then Stephanie mentions to me that she is involved in one of the committees that uh, will be spoken about here shortly. So I asked her if she would give us a quick update on what is the NHF and HFA collaboration all about? Uh, so, hi everybody. So we are um, really excited about the Needs Assessment Committee. Um, it's a very small group of folks, um, leaders from NHF and HFA have come together. There's myself from the chapter, um, sector. There's Lisa Ratterman um, out of Ohio and uh, Madonna Smith from Oregon. And we've been meeting and just trying to figure out what kinds of surveys we can send out to the uh, chapters at the moment to figure out what exactly is needed uh, across the board. Um, ways that both national organizations can collaborate more in the future. Uh, there was a, the first survey went out uh, a couple weeks ago and we were thrilled to have, um, I think it was close to 80 or 85% response to the survey, which for the first survey um, of many that we will be doing, we were thrilled about that. So uh, we're going through data. Uh, the update today is pretty much just a high level um, overview of what the survey that everybody just filled out um, was about, what we're doing with the data, and um, what's to come. Is there a, a top line takeaway that you could uh, let the people at home know about? Uh, from the survey that was just completed? Yeah, and that will be spoken about here in a little bit. Um, just reinforcing the collaborative efforts of NHF and HFA in ways um, currently that they are able to do, but also in the future. Uh, that's really the goal of this, to see what the uh, chapters need, what the community needs, um, and ultimately send that voice up to the national level. Uh, another collaboration between NHF and HFA from earlier this year was the Safety Summit. Did you participate in that? I did. I've been very curious to talk to someone who participated in that as well. What were your takeaways from the Safety Summit? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Um, I didn't know what to expect initially um, because safety you know sounds like such an easy term but yet you know given the history of our community we want to make sure that um, you know I wasn't sure what to take away from it but it was a great opportunity to again have a very intimate select group of um, folks from around the country industry folks were there community uh, families were there a couple chapters were there um, and we were able to talk about what's some of the you know recent um, recalls and things of that nature and also do some case studies of our own. We had breakout sessions where we talked about um, there were mock um, you know announcements that went out about certain recalls or trials and we got to talk about what could have been done better, what announcements should have went out and it was just really eye-opening how we're addressing that still today um, but also how to improve it if God forbid something were to happen. That is very comforting. Um, and also another reason that the NHF and HFA collaboration and unity on these things is so important. Uh, so last question for you. You did just mention to me that this is your first Washington Days experience. As we're getting ready to wrap it up, what are you going to be going back to New Jersey with? Oh, with all the energy possible. Uh, we had about three or four families from New Jersey here with us, and I cannot wait to share the enthusiasm of how much of a wonderful experience this has been. Um, the families that were able to join us this year really loved it, and I really hope that next year I can get, you know, double the amount of families to really understand how important it is to be in front of your legislators and to tell them about your story. It's impactful. Um, we had uh, one family who uh, the mom brought pictures of her son as a baby just having bruises all over his legs and you could see that the the look on people's eyes are like wow this really is it, it gives a tangible understanding to what hemophilia and bleeding disorders are so I hope the enthusiasm can drive families to come with me next year and I'm thrilled about it and I'm thrilled I can leave Washington days feeling like I got everything I wanted to get because that last little piece of information Stephanie was able to provide thank you so much Stephanie thank you thank you too okay here we go first names only Stephanie Jen 
Len, Joanna, Max, Scott, Mia, Felix, Chris, Rachel, Sue, Rigo, Ivan, Sonji, Michael, Sarah, and anyone whose name I may have left out for your contributions to this episode. Thanks as well to Michelle Kim and the staff from the Hemophilia Foundation of Southern California, as well as to the staff of NHF, who accounted for my participation a little past the requested deadline. I appreciate that accommodation. Thank you. Also, friendly reminder to Washington Day's attendees, if you haven't already, please fill out the Congressional Meeting Evaluation Form on NHF's website. They are incredibly helpful, and I myself need to do that, which is why I'm remembering to mention it here. At the top, I mentioned that it was pointed out to me I hadn't been to Washington Days in five years. And when that sunk in, to be honest, I felt a little guilty. I know it's not my job to be at Washington Days each and every year or at State uh, Hill Days each and every year. I don't think it's any one person's job to have to be at these things every year. But as a community, we're only as strong as our continued collective efforts. And as Max spoke to earlier, we benefit from a rich history of advocacy in this community. But that rich history is on the back of the awful contamination crisis and devastating need that first galvanized us in the 80s and 90s. The need that brought guys like Chris, who mentioned before he's been attending for decades, out to talk to their representatives. We're fortunate to have this powerful, unified community voice and legacy and to have developed relationships with lawmakers. We cannot take this position for granted. And if we don't care for it, we will lose it. So while it's not my responsibility or your responsibility or any one person's responsibility to go to federal and state advocacy days each and every year, it is only our collective sense of responsibility and willingness to show up that ensures we maintain a small but mighty voice in the halls of Congress and beyond. It won't be five more years before I'm back. More like one or two. Subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating in the Apple Podcast Store. Seriously, it has been too long since someone has, and I know that not all of you have, and that's okay. Just go do it now. And tell a friend about Bloodstream, too. Follow Bloodstream Media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also find me at PJ Lynch on Twitter, Patrick James Lynch on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Loved me some LinkedIn friends. And if you've got something you'd like to say or something you'd like to hear us say, email us mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. There is a new episode of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast out this week. Episode four, A New Hope, which is out right now, features doctors Mike and Amar breaking down Oxbrita, the new sickle cell medication from Global Blood Therapeutics, and the doc's interview GBT CEO, Ted Love. So be sure to check that out and check out Bloodstream Journeys too the Bleeding Disorders Community Storytelling Podcast. Reminder to check out the program notes for important links. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to the Bloodstream Podcast. And until next time, take self-care of yourself.